So we did the easy direction, which is I give you a formula for the nth term, and then you just tell me what the first, second, third, fourth term is. So that's relatively easy to do. Now we're going to go the opposite direction. We're going to start with the sequence and then try to write out what do the what does the pattern actually look like. So can I write a n down that has the pattern that I'm going to write on the board. So let's go ahead and do some examples. So that closed formula just means they'll usually start at one, 0 or 1. They could start at any number you want, but generally the two easiest ones will be start at 0 or 1. And then sometimes they go to some big n value, or they go all the way to infinity. So they don't always start at 1, but usually you'll start them at 0 or 1. And then they'll either go to a finite number or to infinity. So that's what it closed for. And then, of course, the hard part, really the main part, is writing down what in the world's a n. So we'll start out easy. Actually, I'm going to do this in a certain order. We will do that sequence. So how would you describe the pattern here? Goes up by 2 every time. Goes up by 2. So we add 2. So we call this an additive pattern. And one way you can write that, just think 5 to 7, you've got plus 2. 7 to 9, plus 2, plus 2, et cetera, et cetera, like that. So how in the world are we going to write down a n? So let's just take a guess. Two n. All right. Let's start with two n. So what do we get when n is one? What about when n is two? Four. A three. Six. I think I can say et cetera, et cetera. So what part do we have correct? What aspect of the pattern do we have correct? We, we're partially correct. The additive two. So we got that additive pattern, the additive part of the pattern correct. What do we not have correct? Start. We're not starting in the right spot. So what can I do so the 2 turns into a 5, the 4 turns into a 7? So I'm going to do what we call an offset. So instead of starting, uh, I could write down we started at 2n plus 0. So I don't want to start at 0. I want to start at 3. Now there's a, a few ways to do this. I'll do it again in blue slightly differently. So if I do 2n plus 3, all the terms match up correctly. So we got the 5, 7, 9, etc. So this is what we call an additive pattern. And I'm actually going to write this 2 in green, a little bit extra bold, because it is the additive part. It's a little strange because the fact that you added 2 each time turned into multiplying n by 2. So that's not super intuitive right there. You can think of this as a linear function right here. So the slope is 2. That means when you go over 1, you go up 2. And if you think about it like a linear function, over 1, up 2, over 1, up 2, it makes a lot more sense. So when n goes over 1, your y value jumps up by 2. So if you think about it that way, it makes a little bit more sense. And the offset is the vertical. You think either the y-intercept or the vertical shift. So our number progression was too low, so we just pushed it up. So that's uh, an. Now we need to write the closed form of this. 
So I need to write inside curly brackets 2n plus 3, that's the an. Now I have to decide start and finish. So n value starts at 1, the way we wrote it down. So we're OK with the start. What value is this going to end on? Nope. So if we do 101, if I plug that in, I'll get 202 plus 3. So that'll be 205. So that would give me 101 terms. But because the pattern doesn't start at 1 and add 1 each time, I won't end at 101. How in the world do I actually figure out the endpoint? So I could try to do some mental math. How can I use algebra to figure this out? 2n plus 3 equals 101. So there we go. Figure out, I'm going to set the an equal to the last term, and then figure out what does n need to be to get there. So we're going to set, so we're doing the uh, final additive pattern. We're finding the big n, the final uh, value for n. Set 101 equal 2n plus 3. And now it's a really easy algebra problem. So we got 98, 2n, n equals 49, 49. And it's nice to guess and check. Just plug in 49. You got 98 plus 3 is 101. So that works out. So any questions in finding the n value? I will do my best to not uh, make a mistake and give you something like 102. And then obviously, that won't stop. That, that wouldn't be in this pattern. So if you see some mistake like that, you, you can come up and ask me on the mid. Well, this will be on your next quiz. But I'll do my best to not make that mistake. All right, let's solve this a second way in the blue marker. What if? What if I chose an to be 2n plus 1? Would you just set the start n as another one higher? Yep, so we can offset the start value. So if I choose an as this, uh, I really want to start at a2, which is 4 plus 1, and that's 5, and then a3 uh, will be 7, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no reason necessarily to start at 1. Uh, if I go this route, I could do a second version, 2n plus 1 for n equals 2, 2. Now, how does the other, the max value change? I could do exact same thing I did last time, set it equal, and figure out n. It's going to be close to 49. So it will be 50. You can actually, this one's even easier to plug in 50. You just times 2 plus 1, and we got it. So, in general, just think about we shifted our endpoints up one, so we had to compensate and shift our uh, an term sort of back one, which ended up being not the plus one didn't turn into a, a plus two, but we had to think a little bit more. So, if you drop your n by one, uh, what really happens, you have to look. What happens if that decreased by 1? So this is what we call re-indexing. So we shift it one more? Yeah, you can start it at like 28 if you wanted to and you know shift it like that. Uh, you can always count the number of terms. How many terms does this sequence have? 49. I think it does have 49. So we start at 1 and stop at 49. We have 49 terms. Uh, it's a little tricky over here. So the way you can count it is end minus start plus 1. That's how many terms you get. So either way, if we want to count number of terms, number of terms, In, so just in general, a n, n equals, we'll start it at a and stop it at b, is going to be b minus a plus 1. It's a little bit sneaky because when we normally count, 
uh, we don't count the number we start with. You've probably seen little kids try to count an extra one this way, where if they want to get one more than is there or need one more, then they'll just kind of count the first one, like how many days are in a week. Um, it's not the best example. I don't know. It's not, you count the first and the last one right there. So you're kind of counting one twice. No. I don't know, who cares about counting? That's how many terms are in there. <laughs> so let's do the next example. So that was additive. Let's do a non-additive. Not good multiples, so we'll just send this one to infinity. I don't have to worry about with some big power. I think the pattern is easiest to see from 1 to 3 to 9. So if you already see the pattern, that's great. Let's say that you don't see it. Let's try an additive pattern. Plus 2 doesn't work. So you see that's going to fail right there. What pattern is going on? Times three. Times three. So multiplicative pattern. So right here, we're going to multiply by three, multiply by three. Maybe it's better, right? Multiply like this. Multiply by three. So that is the pattern right here. So this is what we call multiplicative. Now, when you see the word multiplicative, your brain might think, ah, why don't we just go 3n? That's multiplying by 3. But this is for an additive pattern, it is multiplying. It looks like multiplication. So a multiplication pattern powers. It's going to look like power. So I want another times 3 times 3 times 3. So it's going to be 3 to the n power. So when n goes up by 1, I don't want to add 3, I want to multiply by another 3. So when n goes up by 1, there's just times another 3. And if you just think the way it works, just like this right here. So every time n goes up by 1, it's 3 times more than the last time that you looked. All right, so that is what a multiplicative pattern looks like. Let's just naively take a n to be 3 to the n and see what we get. So what is A1? Three. Three. That's not where we want to start. That's the third term. So we have a few choices. I could write down A1 is three, A2 is nine. So far so good, but now I have to write down the two previous terms. So what do the two previous terms look like? A of zero. Yep, A zero and A minus one. So if I choose this one, my first term is actually A negative one. So A negative one is three negative one, one third, A zero, three to zero, which is one. So our pattern works right here. You don't have to start at any number in particular. It could be really any integer you want. I'm going to say you have to use integers. You can't start at like two thirds or something like that. So you do have to use integers. So we can write this is equal to 3 to the n. n equals negative 1. We don't stop, so that is going to go to infinity. We don't have to worry about some endpoint. This just keeps going. So I want you to re-index this, so change the inside part so you can start at zero. So I want you to change the inside part so you can start at zero, and that gives you the same sequence.
and I'll call this the BN term so we don't confuse it with AN. Anybody have a good BN? You want to share? That should work. All right, so 3 to the n over 3, also known as 3 to the n minus 1, like that. So what we're doing is we're increasing n by 1 in our index, so we need to compensate and unincrease it by 1 or decrease it by 1. So we did one thing here, so to compensate, we do the opposite. So that is the way to write it here. Or you can write 3n over 3. Now it seems like 3n minus 3 might work. No, that won't work at all. And we'll give us the right value at the beginning. So you can try other stuff, but you want to make sure you try multiple n values. Don't just say, ah, oh, it works for n is 2, so it must work for all the rest. All right, so that is how to re-index. That's definitely a useful skill. So let's do some slightly trickier sequences. Minus 25, negative 5 fourths, 5 sixteenths, and we'll actually stop this at negative 5 sixty fourths. What in the world is happening here? It looks like division, so let's not use, not use the word division, and let's use the word multiplication. So what can I multiply by to move to the next term? Negative one fourth. Negative one fourth. So alternate signs, so this can be negative, and it's a little tricky to see the one fourth unless you look at the last three terms, then it's pretty obvious right there. And you just carry that pattern back to the first two. So we multiply by a fourth, by negative one fourth, So the multiplicative pattern looks like negative one fourth to the n power. So every time you move over, you get another times negative one fourth. So I'll give you a hint. You need to figure out the number c. That works for your choice. And you also figure out where do you want to start. I want you to figure out where should your sequence start and what number, depending on where you start, that'll change the number you put in for C. Either way, your pattern is negative one-fourth to the n power, no matter what. You could do n plus one or n minus one if you want to, but it's going to be negative one-fourth to some n power. So see if you can write out this sequence right here. And there's five terms, so I can tell whatever I put down here, it's going to be that number plus four at the top. That'll give me five terms total.
So if I choose to start at 0, that means my C value would have to be 20 right there. So if I choose to start at 0, my C value would have to be 20. And the question is, does that work on the next one? So 20 times negative 1 fourth is negative 5. So what is wrong? You have a negative where you should have positive. Yep, so I need to make I need to swap the signs. So instead of using 20 for C, I'll go with negative 20. So negative 20 times negative a fourth is positive 5. And negative 20 times 1 16th is negative 5 fourths. And if I go two more terms, I'll get 5 sixteenths and negative 5 sixty fourths. So if I go with this pattern, I go start at 0, go up to 4. <coughs> so that's one way to write it down. Anybody else write a different one? Some of you must start at 1 or 2. Five. So I can see right away the same number of terms. So he's got five terms. So that's correct. And we just got to plug in one. So 80 times negative a fourth is negative 20. And on this one, I don't have to check much more because I got the alternating sign part. And I see that it's going to go uh, multiply by negative a fourth every time. So there are other ways to write it down. Uh, you could even start at negative 1 or negative 2. So there's another multiplicative pattern. All right, last one we'll do. So this one's legitimately tricky. Those numbers look close to numbers we looked at for factorial. Hopefully I did that right in my head. Except those factorial numbers, what was different about that progression? All right, factorial. We computed some factorials. So I wrote down factorials, except I did one less than every factorial number here. So if you see that progression right there where they're growing quickly, it's either going to be a, uh, a polynomial, an exponential, or a factorial, if they're going to grow very quickly like that. So underneath it, what I'm going to do is write down the same numbers, except one more. So these numbers should become more familiar to you, the sequence right here. So if I continue with the blue, that's 0 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial, etc., etc. So that's pretty easy to write down, n factorial. That's a n. What do I need to do? That's the blue sequence, though. What do I need to do to get to the black sequence? Just subtract 1. So it's just that offset. 
So that's our AN. And our sequence is going to start at, just looking down here, 0. And then 1, 2, 3. So we're going to write down 0 to infinity. In our next quiz, with the quiz after, will we have to be able to recognize factorials? Yeah. Okay. You don't need to remember numbers past this for factorials. Like, I don't know what the one, I mean, I can figure out the one after 720 if I do a long multiplication or whatever they call that, but I don't really feel like doing it. But I certainly could figure out the next 10 terms if I wanted to. So now we'll talk about convergence and divergence of sequences. So I'm going to define convergence. Now, this only makes sense if you have an infinite uh, series. So it doesn't make sense if you don't have infinity here. So I'm going to make that extra bold. So you have to have that infinity, or else it doesn't make sense to talk about convergence. You'll see why when I write the definition. So this converges to L, some number L, if lim and approaches infinity, a n equals l. So if your terms approach l, when n gets really big, you say it converges. So the way we're going to say define not converge uh, divergence is not <coughs> convergence. So the series diverges if it does not converge. So that's the end of convergence. A n diverges if it does not converge. So why do I not write down some n equals something down here? If you take a limit, does it matter what the first 10 terms are doing? What about the first 1,000 terms? Nope. So you're going past all those terms, even the first 10 trillion terms, doesn't matter. We're talking about the ones close to infinity. So whatever number you're thinking of, it's terms that are past that number. So it doesn't matter if it starts at 1, 2, 3, or even a million, or a trillion. Whatever number it starts at doesn't matter. It's all about um, what happens as n approaches infinity. And because it is concerned with n approaching infinity, if it doesn't approach infinity, then you know if it stops at you know, 100 instead of infinity, then you can't take a limit. It doesn't make sense. So it only, only makes sense if you uh, have an infinite series uh, sequence. So now we're going to con determine convergence or divergence. So first is negative 1 to the n times 1 over n. The second is just negative 1 to the n. And the third series we go n squared over 2 to the n. So some of these you may have to use L'Hopital's rule. Some of them, maybe not. So I want you to take three limits here and see what you get. Any 
can't use L'Hopital unless you add infinity over infinity or zero over zero. tricky than they appear. So number two is probably the easiest up here. What about number two? Negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one. Does that settle down to any one number? Does it get close to a single number? Nope. If you choose positive one, it's still going to hit negative one repeatedly. And if you choose negative one, it's still going to hit positive one. So it doesn't get close to either of those two numbers. It's always two away. There's always terms that are two away. So this does not exist. 
so <coughs> we would say diverge. So that was number two. Now we're going to go and do number one. Number one, you're going to use the sandwich or the squeeze theorem. So we're going to squeeze negative 1 to the n times 1 over n. So that looks like 1 over n, except sometimes negative, sometimes positive. So I can uh, set up this inequality. It's definitely going to be no less than negative 1 over n, no more than positive 1 over n. And we've been using this uh, sandwich or the squeeze theorem for a while. So I'm just going to write what they converge to. So what do these converge to when as n approaches infinity? So it'll be zero, or negative zero, but still zero and zero. And that's as n approaches infinity, that's going to approach zero. And so the squeeze theorem says that the limit has to be squeezed between these two limit values. So that's the sandwich or the squeeze theorem. So you've got two outside functions that are nice and converge, and you can say your inside function has to converge to a number that's squeezed or sandwiched between those two values. All right, our last, oh, so what does that mean? The limit is zero, and so it converges. So you can say lim n approaches infinity equals zero, so it converges. Diverge, diverge. Any sandwich theorem questions? All right, last up. Now, I'm pretty sure L'Hopital's rule is necessary on this. So, you can find infinity, use. L'Hopital's rule, uh, n squared derivative is 2n, 2 to the n derivative, is that 2 to the n times ln 2? Is that right? Somebody remembers their derivatives? I think it is. I think the antiderivative is where you divide by the ln 2. Is it ln 2 over Well, you got the 2 to the n times the ln2. So the 2's cancel. Whoa. Well, that's a really nice way to cancel. Well, they don't cancel like that. <laughs> that could reduce 1. <laughs> it could be Actually, if you cancel it, that's how it would look. But I don't recommend doing that. It is how it works, the way I just wrote it, but that's very fancy. So let's take out that constant, which is 2 over ln2 times lim n approaches infinity. And we're left with n over 2 to the n, which of course is infinity over infinity. So we're going to use low p tau's rule a second time. However, this time, our derivative in the numerator is very nice. Derivative of n is a 1, and denominator 2 to the n times ln 2. And now we can see, taking the limit is going to be 1 over infinity, which is 0. So this is going to converge to 0. Now, a nice thing to keep in mind, exponent, uh, exponential functions beat polynomial functions. I could have put a 200th power right here. I would have needed to do 200 L'Hopital's rules, but after that, I would determine that 2 to the n is going to win. So if you're clever, you can do L'Hopital's rule once and then write an inequality 
and go off of that. But uh, for any polynomial, no matter the degree, an exponential function uh, will beat it as long as the base is bigger than 1. Uh, now, if the base is less than 1, if this was uh, 0.2 to the n power, well, that's going to get smaller and smaller. So that's very different. All right, so that will converge. So if you need to look back at the sandwich theorem, go for it. It's back in when we did limits uh, somewhere in chapter 2. I can't remember at all where. Somewhere in the middle of chapter 2 is sandwich theorem. So if sandwich theorem is not uh, familiar to you, look it up in your textbook. What's the fastest way to figure out where sandwich theorem is in your textbook? Index. So if before they had Google, they had indexes. So in the back of your textbook, alphabetically ordered, is a list of most of the important topics in your textbook. So go back there and look at Sandwich Theorem. They'll tell you, hey, it's on page whatever, 127, something like that. And you flip right back to 127. Uh, so I recommend uh, use the index in your textbook. The other way to do it is basically read, skim through chapter 2 until you see Sandwich Theorem and hope you don't flip by it. The two pages aren't stuck together you're not paying attention or something like that and you just go right over it. So use the index. And we're going to do two more examples. So we did CN we'll do KN Last, we'll do LN. Oh, that's not a good name. This, the last one actually has a natural log in it. MN, I guess. LN of N over N. did I do on this first step here? So obviously I'm taking the limit to find convergence. What did I do to go across this equal sign? So use a continuity of what function though? Square root. Of the square root function. So I pushed a limit past, basically past the square root function. Um, and it might be easier to see if you think about it like this with the square root. And it looks like that. So it was outside the square root and it went to the inside. So that would be with regular square root notation versus the other notation. So you should be able to find that inside limit relatively easily. I think you can use physicist method if you want to. So you look at high powers of n, high powers of n. So that plus one won't make a difference at all. So forget about that right there. So it'll be 4 over 1, which will be 4. So let me use the, I'll use the magic green pen. So the physicist method says that 1 doesn't matter, that plus 1. So it's going to be 4 square root, which is 2. It doesn't have to be 0, it just has to not be in, it just has to be a number, a real number. So that converges. All right, last one. 
So you can do L'Hopital's rule in 30 seconds. I probably picked for these problems too many that converged and not enough that diverged, but in general, don't assume that there's a higher chance it converges than diverges. You don't want to be going there with a biased idea of, oh, it's probably going to converge. Maybe it will diverge. So just don't go in thinking it's probably going to do one or the other. Now, when you look at it, uh, something like this, I can see natural log is going to grow slower than n. So intuitively, it seems like it's going to converge, and that's why. Uh, then you can go through and do the computation. So this will not be on your midterm on Friday, anything from chapter 10.